Hello, welcome to the third episode of Berlin Audio Lab. My name is Haris, and today I'm going to be showing you the mix of the Gentle Song. If you haven't checked episode two out, it's a good time to go check it out because this is the live performance of the song we're going to be looking at today. A little bit of background about the song. My friend Connor and I, Connor is one of the most talented musicians that I have ever had the pleasure to work with. He's a multi-instrumentalist, songwriter. He's, he's an incredible, an incredible musician. So Connor and I got together. I had written this little tune. Uh, we recorded it live, guitar and drums, in his rehearsal space. Um, and then we added some bass, a bunch of guitars, and uh, a little bit of percussion here and there. Okay, it's a very straightforward song. It's a very straightforward session. So let's dive right in. Here's the session. Quick run through. These blue faders are the drums. They all meet here at the drum bus. Then these lighter blue faders are percussion. They have their own bus here. Then I have two sources for the bass, one DI and one mic. This is an interesting kind of bass sound. We're going to be going a little bit deeper into it. This is the bass bus. Same deal with the guitar, two mics, they meet here at the guitar bus. We have these acoustic guitars, they go straight to the two bus. And these ambient guitars that go here, that's their bus, and then they go to the two bus. All the previous buses I've showed you, they all go straight to the two bus. Then we have these lighter brown tracks that are guitars, but they are meant to sound like a Hammond B3. That's the bus, and that goes to the stereo bus. Then have three reverbs here, these tracks. These go straight to the stereo out. They don't hit this processing. I'll tell you why later, once we get a little bit deeper. Okay, so here's what I have on the stereo bus, because we're going to be monitoring everything through that. So there's this compressor. Um, as far as I know, this is emulating a Neve-style compressor. There's this EQ. You can see there's a bunch of noise uh, because I kind of liked the noise in this um, uh, style of track, so I lift it in. Um, tape machine, huge part of the sound, 7.5 IPS, uh, a little bit of a higher bias, uh, gives it a very audible bass bump. Uh, cassette emulation, more bass bump and shaving of highs, a little bit of pull tech, boosting by the same amount around 60, and then boosting a bunch of top end, and then just running through the default setting of this red console emulation by Waves because I really love what it did to the sound. This whole chain outputs here to the stereo out. This is where these three guys and all the rest meets. Further EQ, another tape machine, and a limiter boosting a bunch of level. I'll bypass everything except for the limiter so that there won't be any huge level change. And let's see what the stuff does. So as you can see, the mix completely falls apart when I bypass all that stuff. This is an excellent example of top-down mixing. Like I've showed you in episode one with the drums, you can think of these approaches when thinking about the entire mix. So literally the first thing I did was got a balance with the faders and then just got a sound on the stereo bus and then I was mixing into that. So that's why the mix makes no sense without these plugins. They're meant to be there because I was mixing everything, listening through this chain. So now that you've seen that, let's go check out the drums. They have very little processing. There's a reverb send, a bunch of EQ on the toms. I'm gonna go into it a little bit more. 
then on the overheads I'm switching left to right the drums were recorded drummer's perspective which is usually the way I do it but since there was a video associated with it it would have sounded kind of backwards so I had to go audience perspective bit of EQ on the overheads just boosting a bit of 100 with a pull tech and taking out a massive resonance uh, probably the rack tom so let's listen to the drums with and without processing here's with and without. Pretty massive difference. The biggest difference is created by this plugin. This is a plugin made by Klanghelm. It's a distortion plugin, has four types of distortion. I'm using the tube algorithm. And what that does is that it makes everything warmer, has less top end, and distorts beautifully. So let me bypass just that plugin. So I got it set right at the sweet spot. So it's like right before actually distorting. You can hear the snare kind of being crunchy in a way I, I really love. Um, but the biggest difference is that all the super top frequencies are, are gone, which is something that I really enjoy for this style of music, this kind of vintage vibe it gives it. So let's look at the floor tom. So pretty heavy handed EQ move. But what's interesting about it is the following. Let me bypass it so that you can hear how it sounds flat. You might be wondering, I'm boosting 6 dB, 5.5 dBs, super wide, but it sounds like I'm doing way less, right? Okay, so here's the trick. This A knob here is auto gain. If you enable it, whatever you do on the Pro Q3, it matches the output. It automatically levels it. So I always use the auto gain when... I want to change the tonal nature of something very dramatically. This tom was too dark for my taste, but I didn't want to boost 60 dBs of top end and make it louder. I wanted to stay where the mix balance was, but just change the tone, shift it. It's a great, great trick. Same deal with the rack tom. It's a bit of a more extreme boost. Exactly the same idea with the auto gain here. Nothing of interest in the overheads, just a bit of EQ. Um, and taking out a resonance. Then we got these, um, they're called brushes, but they're, what they really are is just me uh, doing this and recording it. Um, and here's how it sounds. Very boring, right? But there's an interesting thing here. So listen to what was actually recorded, and then I'm going to show you a little trick for this kind of stuff that really is effective. Okay, and then I'm going to add these two faders as well. Check it out with and without. It is very low in the mix, but it really makes a big difference. When these are muted, you don't really hear the, the swooshing. 
when I turn them on, this comes closer to you and you kind of tell there's a pulse to it. Okay, so this is a trick I shamelessly stole from uh, Chad Blake. I'm using a Sans Amp. If you don't have a Sans Amp, any distortion or amp distortion plugin will do. So this is what the sound is. It kind of drops the pitch. Check it out. Without. It's like a pitch shifting plugin. It's very easy to do. Usually you don't even have to do much. It's just levels. Uh, and again, if you don't have the Sansam plugin, you can do it with any sort of um, amp emulation plugin. This is my go-to processing for a shaker, a tambourine, any kind of high-pitched percussion gets this treatment. It always works. Bass. Okay, here's the raw bass in all its glory. This is ukulele bass. Tiny little thing, you can see it in the video, plastic strings, costs like 50 bucks, and it sounds gigantic. So here's the bass without any plugins. Pretty amazing sound. This is a DI. This is the mic. Uh, it's a mic on the instrument. It's not on an amp or something. It's an acoustic sound. Here's with all the processing. All right, let's quickly look what all that stuff is. All right. Here's a massive EQ cut on the microphone. I don't want to use it for the low end. Obviously, I'm sure you know by now, linear phase EQ, because they're meant to add up and still stay in phase. This is a great plugin that makes any mono sound stereo in a really cool way. Check it out. Pretty incredible. Moving on, here's what's happening on the bus. This is a crazy plugin. I love it. It does all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm using it for a bit of distortion, and this is kind of like a quality degrading knob because, as you heard, it has a lot of wooden sounds and a lot of top end to it, and I didn't really want that in the mix. So here's with and without. tightens it up, distorts it a little bit. Sounds kind of like an amp. Then our good old friend Soothe, getting rid of some uh, resonances. This flanger is barely mixed in. I just like what it did. Okay, then compression. It's on auto release, which is a setting I always go for if I want the compressor to act like someone riding a fader, you know? Like it's constantly micromanaging the levels. It doesn't just react to peaks. You would need to go somewhere here to do that. This, it's kind of like always acting, but very, very subtly. Here's our little friend again. If you remember, this is the same plugin that I use for the drums, but on the desk algorithm. And this EQ is automated. It's automated right here. There was a ringing tone that I wanted to get rid of. Uh, this is something I do a lot, automating EQ moves like that. Sometimes it's really necessary. All right, guitar land. So you'll notice there's this muted um, nature to the tone, right? I got some blue tacks. This is this kind of stuff. 
it's kind of rubber stuff that you use to stick posters on the wall. And I put that across the strings on the bridge. Um, and this is the muted sound you're hearing. I'm not actually palm muting everything because it would be impossible to play the part. This is what the recording sounded like. Okay, so I had two mics. One is panned down the center and turned down, and the other one is panned all the way to the left. Essentially, I'm using these mics for placement, tilting the guitar. So, two different tremolo settings. One is on the Fender setting, and the other one is on the Premiere setting, um, just to further widen the image. a little more ethereal sounding. It's very subtle though. EQ, tape machine. So sometimes I was hitting so hard that I, I just max out the VU meter. What that does, and this is one of the most uh, cool uses of tape machines. If you have stuff that have a lot of peaks, Instead of compressing them, you can use a tape machine and uh, set it so, so that the loudest peak goes into the red here. And you'd be surprised how many dBs of perceived loudness you can get. So let's actually go and look at that. Let me bypass the tape machines, go to a really peaky section. Let's see what the peak meter is gonna say. All right, so minus 13.6. Okay, let's check it out with the tape machine. Um, three. We just gained three dBs, and I don't know about you, I don't hear a single level difference. Check it out. Magic, right? Just gained 3 dBs of level without making it quieter. Um, okay, guitar bus. EQ, making it darker, shaving off some excessive subs, managing some resonance. And I'm using this Analog Obsession plugin, which is a preamp. I love the way this guy distorts. Let me exaggerate it to see like what the nature of the saturation of this plugin is. It's really beautiful. See what I mean? It's like, wow, it sounds like a beautiful amp or something. Uh, all their plugins are incredible, by the way. Analog Obsession, check it out. Red, again, um, I'm taking out a little bit of lows, but mostly I'm using it for noise. Managing more resonance. And finally, compressor. Remember, all these stages, like the tremolo being the first stage of managing dynamics, then the tape machine, then this distortion, which does exactly the same thing as the tape machine, just shaves off peaks, then the red, exactly the same thing, then managing resonance, and only then compressing. This is something that I do more and more. Instead of just putting a compressor on something, I try to smoothen out the sound any other way I can so that in the end, I don't need to compress that much. So I don't remember how much this was compressing, but I wouldn't, I would say it's probably maximum three dBs or something. Let's see. Yeah, not even, it's just barely on. So that's the guitar. Moving on, there's this acoustic guitar. Taking out a bunch of low end. This Arturia Mellofy plugin. Love it. 
it's yet another way for me to shave off all the high frequencies in this mix. Reverb mixed in 100%. <laughs> um, flanger, quite a bit of it. And then yet another reverb. There's another guitar. And what that is, you can see in the video, <clears throat> it's an acoustic guitar. I'm holding the slide on the 12th fret, but I'm not plucking the strings in front of the slide. I'm plucking the strings behind the slide. That's what gives it this kind of chorusy, chimey um, nature. they add a bit of depth and they help the arrangement grow. Okay, so I have these ambient guitar stuff here. So it's essentially one track and then copied two times and I'm having three different versions of the crystallizer. One is at 700 cents and the other one is at 1200 cents so it's the same audio but pitched differently it's not mixed in 100 percent and they're all bust here with that shaving off all the top end again and finally um here's this b3 thing i was telling you about so this is what was recorded What this is, is a freeze pedal going into a volume pedal that I'm fading in. Plus, there's a bunch of automation on the bus, which is also kind of dealing with the level. But that's what it is. Mono, freeze into a volume pedal through the amp. So I put all this stuff on it and then printed on this track. And why did I do that? Because as I was printing, I was playing with the Leslie, fast and slow, right? So... Uh, I couldn't automate that, so here's the print of that with a bit of a pan man panning it left and right. In the source, it kind of sounds like a Hammond B3. Here's a good time to tell you guys why I didn't want the reverbs to go through all this heavy coloration of the multiple tape machines and the cassette tape. I wanted the reverbs to have some air on top. So this is a trick that I often use. It's not always necessary and it's all, not always the right call, but it's something that uh, can be very useful and quick. Instead of just by default routing your effects to the two bus you can consider bypassing the two bus in this case i didn't want all the top end of the reverb to get sucked out because of the heavy coloration i'm using on the two bus and speaking of the master bus i'm going to show you this tape machine thing the reason why i did it is the same you remember how i told you that uh i wanted to shave off some peaks of the guitars with the tape machine, it's exactly the same reason. So this is probably shaving a dB and a half or something. Okay, minus 9.2 peak level. Let's see without the tape machine now. It's 1.1 dB higher without the tape machine. But the interesting thing is that there is no perceived level difference. Listen to it. It just catches that super quick peak. 
This is a very neat trick, and I'm not hitting it hard. You can go up to zero without hearing it, and you can go over zero without hearing it, except if you have a lot of low end, which is the case in this track, so that's why I was very conservative. And then the limiter boosting about 10 dBs of level. So to finish this off, let's listen to the whole mix now that we know where all the bodies are buried while looking at this integrated LUFS value. I hope you liked this one. I hope you were able to get something useful out of it. And if you did, please like and subscribe, share with your friends. See you next time.